Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, heroes and villains. I'm your host, Deshaun Fauntleroy. I know your time is precious, so we're going to get right into today's show. In today's show, the big idea is Jaron Mastro. Now, let me tell you something about him. He graduated from high school with a 4.02 GPA while starting varsity football and basketball for three years. Now, check this out. He garnered the recognition of several Ivy League schools, but eventually he opted to pursue his dream of college football at Kansas State University on full athletic scholarship. We got a lot to discuss today, so I'm going to front load this show. Today, we're going to be discussing the NFL experience, developing developing a mindset for stiff competition, strategies to overcome adversity, how to bounce back after injury, how to become pain-free in 10 days. We'll also discuss some of Jaron's favorite team-building exercises, and from there, we'll conclude with the benefits of having a performance coach. Now, as I said before, the big idea is Jaron Mastro. What I want to tell you about him is that he played and started in 48 out of 49 possible games at Kansas State University, earning first team all Big 12 honors as a senior. Now, check this out. Upon graduating cum laude in the winter of 2009, Mastro decided to pursue his dream of playing in the NFL. Despite failing his medical examinations at the 2010 NFL Scouting Combine, he signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as an undrafted free agent. He would later be released at the beginning of September 2010. Immediately following his release, Jaron spent two days with the New England Patriots before being let go yet again. However, on the way to the airport with his future in limbo, Mastro got the call from the Miami Dolphins. It was there that he would make a home for the 2010, 2011 and 2012 seasons. He finished his career starting 22 games, including the entire 2013 season for the Oakland Raiders, where he was also team speaker and guest captain. Check this out. After his one-year contract with the Raiders expired, Mastro signed with the Bears. Before heading off to training camp, he founded Pacific Neurotherapy, a company which helps people overcome injury or eliminate chronic pain in 10 days or less. More on that later. After his release at the end of training camp, Mastro returned to Portland to grow his company. Now check this out. For the last two years, Jaron has been leading his team at Pacific Neurotherapy and overseeing business development, expansion, direction, and leadership. He has also co-founded Reyes de la Tierra, an agricultural real estate company that experienced 40% annual returns each year of its existence. He is currently involved in Jet Resorts, a vacation rental home company currently serving the Gatlinburg, Tennessee area. Without further ado, I want to bring on Jaron Mastro to the Sports Mastery Podcast Show. Jaron, tell us what you've been up to lately, man. Man, I appreciate the intro. That is uh, quite the detail. I didn't know you were going to bring up Jet Resorts and Reyes de la Tierra, but uh, that's always nice to bring up. I love those uh, projects. Um, what I've been up to lately, I am, uh, you know, just got my workout in this morning, if you want to talk about this morning. Uh, had to get that in at the gym, and then uh, I'm working on finishing up my book. I'm actually looking to release that thing by the end of the month, uh, just finalize the content inside, making sure the cover's all good, and getting that ready to go. So in the short term, I'm really looking to get that thing done. And then uh, football season's right around the corner, and uh, we got some new programs at Pacific Neurotherapy that we want to get rolling for uh, you know quarterback shoulder therapy programs so they can stay fresh all season, uh, as well as some other uh, ACL and uh, ankle sprain prevention programs that I want to get rolling too so we can help these athletes uh, stay in tip-top shape. That's awesome, man. I know you were talking about your book. Um, what's the name of the book? And could you give us a brief overview of what it's about? I can give you a little bit about that. I know they've been kind of hesitant on me getting too in depth on it, but it's called Stand Tall, which is actually a title my mom came up with. Because uh, not only am I tall in stature, I'm about 6'6. Six, six, uh, and she was always getting on me about, you know, getting out there and just being who you are and standing up and being proud and not, you know, 
whether it's physical posture of, you know, slouching down to people shorter than you or, uh, you know, playing down to your competition or just, you know, maybe not being humble or uh, not being able to bounce back from a loss, all those types of things. I felt like that title really symbolized a lot of the content in the book and what I was talking about. Uh, and the biggest part of it is how to lead from within and build high performance teams. So those are uh, some key pieces that I include throughout the book. Excellent. Excellent. You know, um, you, you played in the NFL. So, you know, that's one of my first questions because, you know, I grew up playing football my whole life. You know, I got as far as playing, having a few CFL tryouts, playing on two different um, indoor teams, playing um, four or five years of semi-pro football, playing at Portland State, finishing at Western Oregon University. But, you know, that dream was always there of playing in the NFL, and I lived it as far as I could. Tell us a little bit, man, about your NFL experience. I'd say, you know, it was something that kind of just, I wouldn't say it just showed up, but it was something I just kept my head down and just kept going. Because all the way back in high school, I was never, I don't know if I was even considered the best player on my own team, let alone the best player in the league or the best player in the state. I mean, I know a lot of kids these days get a little tripped up on, you know, being first team all league. I was second team all league tight end my senior year. And three other kids got picked over me for first team. So I was considered the fourth best tight end just in Beaverton. So it just never, if I would have let that get to me, it would have never seemed promising of, am I going to go play in the NFL, let alone, you know, college and all that. So I always just kind of kept my head down and kept grinding, kept working out, kept trying to get better every day and doing something to improve my skills. And, you know, one thing led to another of going to Kansas State. And then I repeated the same process there. And that set me up for success to get an opportunity in the NFL. And, you know, as you mentioned in the intro, I, you know, went to Tampa Bay, got cut, went to New England, got cut, and then went to Miami and just kept at it and kept doing what I knew best. And they liked me there and things worked out. So I had, you know, three years there and applied the same thing in Oakland and it worked out well there too. And now I've been trying to transition those same skills that got me that far over to the business world. Yes, sir. Now, if I heard it right, didn't you play quarterback in high school and then later switched over to tight end in college? Yeah, I we didn't have a quarterback on our team and it was probably the best option for the team for me to play quarterback, even though I wasn't a prolific passer. You know, I was clearly better at tight end. Obviously, I also played defensive end. So schools could at least see me be physical defensively and not just think like, well, he's just some quarterback. So they could see my physical play on the defensive side of the ball. And then offensively, they could see I had an understanding of the game. And then uh, my sophomore year, I had a couple games at tight end. And then my senior year, I had a couple games at tight end. But it was never any more than three games at tight end either of those seasons. So that's also part of the reason I didn't get first team all league. But uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't play often at tight end. But I always, I always wanted to play it. I love the combination of catching passes and a couple passes and blocking people and hitting. And I just, I always liked it. I don't know why. Yes. I, I know you mentioned playing uh, high school football here in the Portland Metro area. What, what school did you play at in Beaverton? Southridge. Southridge. You know, uh, what was that like playing over there? Well, it was, it was a real interesting situation because my parents are both from Beaverton, but after they graduated from Oregon State, my dad took a defensive coordinator job down at Roseburg High School. So they lived there for 18 years, and that's where myself, my brother, and sister were born. So we only knew Beaverton is where all of our relatives live, but we were from Roseburg. And then Southridge opened up, and it was an opportunity for my dad to become a head football coach, which is what he always wanted. So he took the job in 1999. So when I was 11, going into sixth grade, we moved up here. And, you know, there were some rough years to start with and people thought he wasn't a good coach and, but our youth teams were always really good. So I was like, well, as soon as we get to the school, we're going to win. And, uh, when I got there, you know, I had to deal with being a freshman and all the older kids, you know, not only, you know, knowing him and knowing that I'm the coach's kid and stuff like that, but Hey, they're also supposed to be some really good athletes in this grade too. And, uh, just a lot of different, I mean, Definitely wouldn't call it bullying or anything, but just, you know, got to deal with people talking crap about your dad or the coach, which I had to learn to separate like, hey, you got 
you can say what you want about him being your coach, but I know when I get my time to shine that we're going to be good. So it was nice to be coached hard and coached well. And I think it ultimately made me the player I ended up becoming because it helped me learn to pick up on certain defensive tendencies because I was always watching the film with him at home. So I was able to become a student of the game at a young age without even really realizing it. And then when I got to college, I realized the gift that I had of having all this knowledge all the time at home. That was, that was big. So as far as playing at high school, I'd, I mean, a lot of it would be learning the whole game and just play hard from my dad. That was nice to have. Yeah, incredible, man. I really feel like you're dropping a bunch of jewels on us early on. You might not even realize that. But one thing I can say, I know a few different um, coach or father son coach combinations. Mm -hmm. When you look back on that experience and and the uh, psychological and the social dynamics of that, what would you say out there to the uh, uh, father son coach athlete combination today? I'd say, I mean, you got to be patient. I mean, you're going to have your moments. I mean, there were times where I'd call my mom and have my mom come pick me up. So, cause I wouldn't want to ride home with him. Uh, you know, we'd be frustrated, but I appreciated how hard that he was on me, uh, because it, it just made everything else seem easier. So I could always take hard coaching in college and in the pros. And I was able to deal with stuff from a, you know, from an intense spotlight. Cause I always felt like when I was playing in high school, this isn't just for me personally to win. It's for him, for the team, for all of us. You know what I mean? So I learned to be a good team player, I would say, and learn to be a better leader and understand, you know, all the work that the coaches are putting in too. Cause I would see it and see all the time he was putting in and what they were getting paid in return is nothing for what they are doing. So it helped me be a better leader because I could really understand the message that they were trying to reiterate and it made the team continuity and overall dynamic just more, the, the chemistry was just better all around with having my dad as a coach and me being able to relay that message and being well respected for my peers because they knew I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sucking up or I wasn't trying to be, I was just, I was being me, but I was also being the best I could for the whole team too. Yes, sir. You know, um, I wanted to switch lanes here real quick, getting back to your NFL experience playing with four different teams. Mm -hmm. What's the smack talk like in the locker room at the NFL level? Man, it's it's <laughs> crazy because you're, you're playing with a bunch of different people from all over. So, you know, you got like I'm I'm from Beaverton, Oregon, and then you got guys from Miami and New York and Virginia and Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, California. So there's I'd say. One thing that's always pretty common is the, you know, especially the California, Texas, Florida guys trying to say which state is the best for football. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that one's always going on. There's, I mean, just, you know, who's coming from Oregon, you know, that type of thing. Cause I'm always trying to represent, you know, the talent out here. There was actually at one point when I was on Miami, we had five guys from Oregon on the team. Uh -huh. So it's pretty cool to have five of 53 people from once from here because that's not common. Um, I would say I just dealt with a lot of different, just a lot of different styles of smack talk too. You know, just guys from different different neighborhoods growing up speak differently or use different words. I mean, is it's fun. I, I like the, I love the trash talking. I I like talking trash too, and you know, rubbing it a little bit in people's face when you get one on them and, you know, then they'll let you know and they get one on you. So I, I like that whole uh, dynamic as well. Right. You know, I, I can really appreciate that, the, you know, being an athlete growing up in the city, you know, just the psychological dynamics that comes with that. If I could do it in a way and talk you out of, out of your game without overly making you feel like you've been disrespected. I feel like I have an edge, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it's also funny and theatrical, you know, you're having fun at the same time, especially when you don't take it personal, but it, you know, it can change when guys get to taking things personal or you can talk them out of their game. You know, the reason why I bring that up is I talk to my athletes, my student athletes about that, especially the kids that play football was when I was at Portland state, you know, 
um, I w- the first year I was there, Pokey Allen was the head coach. And then it was later it was Tim Walsh. And we always had 20 to 25 guys come in from California every year and lots of smack talk. And, you know, for me, I, I just gravitated towards it. I could appreciate it. And it was one of those things. If, if you were upset with somebody talking about your game, the only thing you could do would, would be to get better or, or work on your craft. You know, playing in the NFL, Jaron, how did you develop your mindset for stiff competition or who helped you with that? How did it evolve when you reflect on that? Because I know you you went through a, tra- a phase where you were cut by a couple of different teams and then you were see some of the same guys that you beat out at a prior team. Mm-hmm. I, I, I learned that, you know, I'd heard from guys, one of my roommates and best friends from college, he left early. Uh, and, and went as a junior to the NFL. So he was actually the quarterback for Tampa Bay. So that was partly the reason I chose there because I knew I knew all the plays already because he told me they were the same from college. So I knew I'd have a leg up in terms of offensive study, but I also learned that you know, you're not playing when you go to the NFL. You're not playing with teenagers or amateurs anymore. You're playing with professionals and people that have families to support and you know have a living and mouths to feed. So you know they're out there doing what they need to do. So uh, I just learned that, hey, maybe you might not be a fit for one team, but you could be a fit for another team that maybe has a different style. So uh, at Tampa Bay, there was three guys that were eight, nine, and 10 year veterans, and two of them were former first round picks. And, you know, they liked what I could do, but it just wasn't, it wasn't, you know, they didn't know is as a rookie, is he gonna be able to do what this guy can do that's been playing for 10 years? He could, but we don't know. So. It didn't work out there, but over in Miami, you know, hey, they were willing to take a shot on a young guy and have me come in and, and get playing time right away as a rookie. And then coming full circle, that opportunity that didn't work out in Tampa Bay, that offensive coordinator then became the offensive coordinator in Oakland. And he was the reason I ended up getting to Oakland, along with the offensive line coach being the former head coach in Miami. Both of them knew that, hey, he can get the job done and he'll do exactly what he's told, which all of that would stem back to growing up and playing with my dad and saying, hey, this is your responsibility on the field. You need to do this. And if you do that and everyone else does what they're supposed to do, we'll have success. So learning to do your job as well as you can and not trying to do other people's jobs was something that I continued to learn throughout high school, college, and pro. And then also stiff competition. I grew up playing basketball and I always wanted to play in the NBA. And then I kind of got in some leagues and in some AAU programs where I finally realized that I might be out of my element and a little out of my level of ability, but I was never going to not compete. So uh, I would say putting myself in in atmospheres all the time when I was young to go always go and play the best and always look to play the older kids or the be- kids that are better. Never go try to play people that you can always beat because that's not going to make you any better. So I was always seeking top competition or the best people out to either work with or play against. So I could either learn what makes them so great or playing against them will up my level of play. And over time that held true. You know what, uh, audience, if you're out there listening to this parents, if you're listening to this coaches, if you're listening to this athletes, if you're listening to this, make sure you download this, listen to this two or three times. Jaron is saying a lot here. I don't know if you realize it, Jaron, One of the things that I always express to my athletes, especially the ones that start getting recruited as a sophomore, junior, I tell I explain to them to be polite um, when the when these coaches come and see you be honest, be up front. When the small school, when the small schools want to come and see you come and let you know, let those guys in too. Uh, don't act like you're better than them. I know you're thinking you might want to go D1. That's every kid's dream. But don't offend or inadvertently offend an NAI coach, a JUCO coach, because you could be a sophomore or a junior and next year he could be the guy at a D1 or Pac-12 school recruiting you. I can appreciate your story. With the offensive coordinator being at Tampa Bay and then he later goes to the Raiders. Now, had you offended him or or been some type of a jerk, that would have never happened. And I, I like to I like to share that or highlight that because in sports mastery, we always talk about the social dynamics and understanding that and getting better at that over time, you know, to put ourselves in the right position, man. And I think you did something very powerful that that is kind of like it was it, you, you didn't even mention it. 
Mm -hmm. I have, I actually have one more piece that'd be, you know, because what you said about the recruitment aspect that it would be even better, I think, for the audience to hear is I, obviously Kansas State isn't recruiting Oregon, or really the West Coast. They're going after JUCO kids out of California, but that's about it out this way. They might try for some high school kids, but not really because it's tough for them to recruit kids away from an area where people might not grow up watching them. So for me, since, as you mentioned in the intro, I was getting recruited by a lot of Ivy League schools, which was a situation I put myself in by having good grades and opening myself up to an opportunity that, hey, that, that's a great, albeit maybe not the best football opportunity, but it's a, obviously a great academic and you know a way to set yourself up for the future type experience. But a coach at Dartmouth actually got hired by Kansas State and they really liked me and I really liked them. And this guy got hired at K-State as a tight end coach and it was kind of late in the recruitment process. It was about November, December uh, in that area and signing day is coming up in February. And he gets there and the, and the head coach asked him, you know, hey, do you have any tight ends that you are that you were looking at that you think we should go after? And he's like, well, I know about, we were trying to get this kid out of Oregon that he looks pretty good. He could can, he can play here. So I said, all right, well, get me a tape. And I sent him a tape the next day. They called me back with an offer, and he flew out and watched me practice, took me out to dinner, uh, spent the day with me. And then a couple of days after that, the head coach flew out and did the exact same thing. And they're like, look, we got a plan for you. We, I know you're about academics. I can make sure you have every academic opportunity you have available here at Kansas State because both my parents are teachers. And, uh, but the, all that stemmed from you know, having a good relationship and setting, you know, being open to the idea of going to Dartmouth and, you know, letting them learn about me and not being an asshole or, right. you know what I mean? Like just, Hey, um, I'd like to go there. And I was, I kept it real with them of what I'm interested in. So they really knew what I liked and Hey, all of a sudden he's at Kansas state. Now let's get you. So it could change in a blink of an eye, the coaching world. I mean, I growing up a coach's kid. I know how fast that coaching world can change. You start losing you get hired somewhere else, staffs get fired and brought in all the time. So never uh, be disrespectful or rude because, you know, they're, they're, they're coming after you for a reason. So there's no reason to be arrogant or, you know, standoffish. Just say hey and you never know what, what could come from it. You know, I, I like listening to your story, man, because you were fortunate enough to have your mom and dad in your corner. But more importantly, you knew what you wanted to do, but you just stayed down with the process. And I, t I often tell kids just this is going to be a process. It's going to be a journey. Don't get caught up in the accolades right now, being on somebody's top 10 list or worrying about the letters you might get from a school as a sophomore or a junior, because I tell kids at the end of the day, nothing matters matters until you sign that scholarship and that letter of intent. And even before that, you have to do what you need to do at the SAT and the ACT levels and have your grades to a certain level to get to that point. So I, I just tell kids to really focus on the grades and just keep working on your strength training, your sprint training and all your skills training. And if you keep your head down, like what you're talking about, everything else will take care of itself in some way, shape or fashion. Mm -hmm. No doubt. You know, uh, you playing in the NFL and being released. I know you had some injuries and getting cut and things like that, being released and then re-signed by different teams. How did you deal with the adversity? What strategies did you have in place then or, or reflecting on it? How do you feel about that now as far as having strategies in place for adversity at such a high level of, of football? Uh. I would say, I mean, once again, it, this this may even go back. I really, I really liked baseball growing up, and I play, so I played all three sports growing up until I was a sophomore in high school. And baseball, I was always one of the top pitchers on our team, and I was always on the all star team. And um, we, I lost the little league district championship as a ninth. A ninth, ten, nine-year-old, ten-year-old, eleven-year-old, and twelve-year-old, all as the starting pitcher, and I was devastated every time. And my mom would always be on me about like, "Well, I'll keep your head up. It builds character." And at the time, I was like, "I don't care about building any more character. I want to win." <laughs> right. Although that's not a big stage, it's the biggest stage I knew as a nine-year-old. Yes. 
as a 10 year old and as an 11 year old. And then when I was 12, when we moved to moved here and I played for the best team in the state and they'd won the state every single year in a row since that program had started. The first year they didn't win the state was the year I played. So it was embarrassing. We had smoked through the whole tournament and then just laid an egg in the championship. So a lot of people came to watch from the neighborhood. So, I mean, I felt like I let the whole neighborhood down at the time. And then going into high school or shoot, middle school football, I, we lost the championship to the same team that beat us in baseball. Felt like I let the whole team down. Then again in football, I lost. I got knocked out of the playoffs my senior year by the same people that beat me in that baseball game and that middle school football game. Beat by the same kids and, and got knocked out as a senior out of that. And I mean, that was the furthest our school had ever gone in history. First time we'd won the league and I thought for sure we we're gonna win the championship. So all these things as like a middle school and a high school kid that losing when I felt like it was all my fault or I had a big part to do with, I think it really made uh, you know, losing on a bigger stage later on a lot. I mean, it's never easy to lose. Like I'm, I'm super competitive. Don't get that confused, but it just made it easy to deal with. Cause I just learned to, you know, there's another day, there's another opportunity. There's a, there's something you can learn from this and move forward with. So instead of just being so devastated by the loss, figure out why you lost and make sure that does not happen again. And I'd say it's a skill that, you know, my mom helped build me up after the loss and then my dad helped figure out you know what went wrong and how you can get better from that so uh that really helped me going forward so i never took losses as i mean i took them for about an hour or two as very devastating and then got over it and learned and moved on and put it behind me because there's nothing about you can't change it once it's already happened so um I mean, does that kind of answer the question, I guess? Yes, it does, because I, I can I can really appreciate you in a sense that you kept playing. You kept coming back year after year and facing the same people, whereas uh, I, I sure I'm sure, you know, people throughout your life experiences of playing sports on and off the field is the ones who can't handle their adversity. And all of a sudden they quit when once they run up on on some stiff competition and then they don't know how to respond to that. So really, really, it, the story is about you're going to get knocked down, but you have to get back up. The worst thing you can do is just get knocked down and then just decide to lay down and stay there, you know, and that could be metaphorically quitting, not coming back, giving up, going to play at a lower level, you know, where you get your way and things of that sort. I mean, a, good, a great example for me that I that I continue to look at in, in my uh, in growing up when I played quarterback, I thought Tom Brady was the best quarterback. So I'd watch him play over and over and he won those championships early, the three he won early in his career and then you know when i went to college then he tore his he ended up tearing his acl uh or he lost the super bowl after going undefeated he tore his acl that one year and you know things they've always continued to say like is this the end for his greatness is this the end for their run and you see that guy bounce back every single season and it just looks better every time and now look he's winning more super bowls and still reigning the afc east and really the whole afc so I mean, that, that's a great guy to watch that even someone that you think is already the best and maybe the best ever at that, at that you know, profession, at that right. position, that he has his moments of getting knocked down and having to come back. So it's not like the best or most successful people out there don't have these moments. You just have to, I mean, well, you, you can't give up, you can't just quit. So you got to push through it and, uh, you know, bounce back even stronger. You know, speaking of injuries, man, and you know, I know you've been through some injuries and you was just talking about Tom Brady and some of his injuries. I've been injured before myself. What would you say to the uh, young athlete, whether they're in high school, college or the professional ranks? What would you say in terms of them or what strategies would you share for like bouncing back after injury, especially mental strategies? Yeah, okay, that's a great piece right there that you just said. So there's there's two things involved with that. I'll definitely say for the younger, younger people in high school and even college. I mean, it could go for pro too. Just start taking care of your body and taking that seriously. Because if you want to be a collegiate athlete, or say even the best high school athlete, and then you want to go to college and then you want to go pro, the majority of those people don't make it that far unless they're taking care of their body, and that includes 
attend in all the mandatory workouts and then some extra. So finding out, maybe you got to take some time with your coaches and figure out what you're weak at, whether it's a, a football skill or sports specific skill or a physical strength issue or a speed issue, a quickness issue, all of those things you can work to improve on and you can do extra. So never do just the mandatory, find some extra things you can do. And then going a little further, there's stuff you can do at home. So instead of just laying on the couch, watching TV or playing video games or doing things that aren't helping you improve and achieve your goals, sure they may help you relax for a minute, but lay down and get a stretch in or hold a plank or do some sort of core work or something that you can throw in. Your physical activity doesn't only need to be the one hour of the workout and the two hours of practice. You can do a, you know, a few things for your body all throughout the day to just make sure you're set up to have success. Um, but the mental side that you mentioned, it's tough. It's real tough when you get injured as an athlete because now you can't do what it is that you feel like is the biggest part of you. So for me, hey, I'm out as a football player. I can't play football. Now, who am I? But first of all, learning to separate that you as the football player doesn't define you. You're a separate person aside from a sport that you're good at. That's one thing. And the other thing is just know that with injuries, it takes time. And if you put in that work each day and keep your head down, you will bounce back and get back to where you are and making sure you have a you know good rehab program and all those things helps with those injuries. But uh, don't let the overwhelming emotional or mental setback of not being able to do what you love affect you too much. Uh, cause it's, it's hard and you'll have to deal with that. But once you put that aside and that you'll, you will bounce back and just keep positive the whole time. Eventually you'll get there and you'll be good to go. Yeah. Parents and athletes, if you're out there listening to this and coaches too, you're going to bounce back quicker after injury. If you keep your strength and conditioning going, if you're doing the off season work, you're doing the transition between sport to sport work, as far as do keeping your strength training. And then you're doing your in season strength and conditioning training. You're doing your mobility work. You're doing the core work. That's just one side of it. When you do have the injury, you have to have your ass in that training room so you can get the body work done or whatever, uh, sports medicine, uh, methodologies that are going to be used. You have to be there. You can't skip out, you know, on your body work or your treatments, as they say. If you have to sit in that hot tub, you got to be there. If you have to get the uh, the electrotherapy, the manual work, whatever it is that that school is offering, you have to be there. You can't skip that. It is a part of the process to getting you back on the field, diamond court or track as fast as possible. Now, I know, Jaron, you're having Pacific Neurotherapy how do you become pain free in 10 days or less? Well, yeah, I'll, t I'll touch on that in a second, but I want to say one more thing for, especially for the high school kids is because we've been seeing, we see a ton of high school kids. And the whole reason I started Pacific neurotherapy was because, you know, I had a knee injury in high school and I had some other injuries that I just didn't really know what they were because it was my first time getting injured. And you know, for most people, their first time getting injured may occur in high school. So how do you deal with that? And, you know, figuring out why it happened and looking to stop that is the whole Thing that we do at Pacific Neurotherapy, so it's not a recurring issue. Uh, but I see a lot of with the high school kids that, that you know there's no warm up involved in what they're doing, so they're not setting their bodies up for success right there. There may be no cool down, so if you have no warm up or no cool down, your body's really not set up for success or to come Certainly. or to come again the next day to practice. You know, and you're like, well, I'm sore, I'm not feeling that great. It's like, well, what did you do extra to get your body ready? I mean, it's a pretty easy question when you go walk, when I walk through the day of what these high school kids may do and they tell me, well, I had class and then I had to go to the mall and then, you know, all these things that none of which correlate to being a successful athlete that I find them doing. So it's more about prioritizing and reorganizing what they're doing with their free time because there's time. Everybody's got the same amount of time. So you need to allocate your time appropriately to setting your body up to where you want it to go. It doesn't just go from a high school kid to, you know, being LeBron James, you need to get ready time and time, day in and day out. Like you mentioned, get in the hot tub or manual therapy or electrotherapy, whatever it is, do something to help your body get better. You know, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to visiting your clinic, man, where I train my athletes at. I, I'm in North Portland at the Portland Athletic Center of Excellence, and it's uh, the storefront is Therapeutic Associates. So, you know, on one side, we have physical therapy. 
licensed massage therapy, acupuncturists, and then chiropractors over there. So for me, it's like I'm around continuing, you know, edu- walk, uh, you know, I'm living continuing education every day as far as doing like the strength training and sprint work that I do over there with my athletes, man. So what what you're saying is like, you know, I'm looking forward to hear about hearing about you having a seminar or a workshop at your place sometime to come check it out. Yeah, that's that's something that I'm looking to get into more of, you know, whether it's for, uh, you know, maybe you have two separate ones, one for high school kids and one for adults. But I just see a lot of people not warming up correctly or not knowing what a dynamic warm up is to get themselves going for a workout. And it's not it doesn't need to be 30 minutes. It can be five to 10 minutes, but just something before you go hop on the treadmill for your 30 minute run every day or something instead of just hopping onto the court and hooping or running out on the field, throw your cleats on and start playing, something to get your body ready to go. And I mean, once again, I know I keep going back to it, but it was an asset to have of my dad being a strength and conditioning coach as well as the football coach. So I grew up with knowing the importance of a dynamic warm up, and it never would occur to me to just go play. I right. knew better than like, hey, you can't just go play. Like you can even do a lunge or a you know, a hamstring activation or any, you know, a plank, a push up, any something to get your body ready for the activity you're about to put it through. So some people just eventually that they can do it early on, but eventually it'll catch up with them. So I'm trying, I do with, um, want to have some of those little seminars to just give people some education and things that they can use. Uh, cause you know, I know I help people that are injured or in chronic pain and I'm, I love doing that, but I want to help people avoid that altogether. So that's my biggest push and some things like that that you mentioned at seminars and classes or things that I would really like to do. Yeah, man, I know um, we train on most days, almost every day we train 90 minutes and we spend anywhere from 30 to 35 of those 90 with our warm up. And we have a six phase dynamic warm up where we start off with a light jog. We do some DNS crawling. And then after that, we'll do the soft tissue work from there. We'll get into the mobility. If the kids have any static issue needs, we might do one or two static stretches. And then after that, we'll get into the dynamic warm up and we'll finish up with some central nervous system activation with some light jumps with the medicine ball or some medicine ball slams up against the wall. But what I found, is we've been having less injuries I, I you know nobody I've never had anybody get injured with me doing any strength work and then they've been having less injuries you know um during the seven on seven football because we we're, we're in that season right now I'm pretty much starting to close out but uh that's what I've been noticing with my kids that are football athletes when they get out there doing the seven on seven work their hamstrings aren't twinging because they're doing all the work and they're warming up properly and they're starting to take some of those concepts onto the field to be a little more thorough. Exactly. That's, that's great. And it's nice to see other people out there teaching it correctly as well. And giving, giving kids things that, you know, they don't need your supervision for, they can do that on their own. And that's, I got into the seven on seven coaching uh, with team Lillard this past uh, winter. Oh man, I probably saw you, man. I was, I was coaching the FSP team, Oregon. Okay, then I saw you because I was going to say, I, was like, <laughs> I know, I, I, just, I looked at your picture and I was like, I know this guy. Uh, but I, you know, we were out there and I could tell some of the kids that work out and have a dynamic warm up and proper, you know, glute activation, hamstring activation, you know, things to get their body ready before playing. And then these other guys that would just show up, throw the cleats on and go play. And then, you know, they get a little ankle roll or a hamstring tweak or a hip flexor tweak. And I mean, you know how those games are. They're 18 minutes long, rapid fire, you know, 20 second shot clock. You're going quick. So, uh, you know, you really have to be in shape for that. And a lot of guys weren't doing the conditioning on their own or the strength work on their own uh, or the mobility work on their own to make sure that they're ready to go. It, 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 it shows up, especially for the receiver corner that has to play both ways because it's, exactly. you're sprinting the whole day. Exactly. That's a perfect yeah. example. And if you're playing four or five games, you might have what that, what is that like three games just to get seated? And you might have another three or four games after that, depending on how far your team goes on those tournament days. Exactly. You know, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you, man, what's one of your favorite team building exercises? Oh, I team building exercises 
I mean, some fun things that they would take us to do in college and in the pros. I liked going bowling as a team, and they would kind of they would they would make the groups, so you wouldn't go and just go with the guys you were kind of friends with on the team. They put you maybe like maybe they'll put a cup like me as a tight end with a a, a, couple, a corner and then a D lineman and then maybe a you know a quarterback. So it was like two offensive guys, two defensive guys that. I'm not spending meeting time with, I'm not doing drills with, I'm actually playing against. So it's an t- opportunity to be a little more lax and play a game that doesn't really require any physical prowess. And, you know, some people are better at bowling than others, but you just roll a ball down the, you know, down the wood and right. strikes pins. I like little games like that, like, you know, card playing games or uh, cornhole, like easy games that are, there's a way to compete. But it's not, it's not like running or lifting or anything like that. It's a little bit out of the element. Um, at Kansas State, we did a thing called cat relays, and they it, this was very much uh, physical prowess. But it was offense versus defense, and you had to do each player had to do three different events like overhead med ball toss, uh, you know, forty five pound plate hold, uh, bench press reps. Um, they made the linemen do uh, bat spins and then run 40 yards down and back, which was hilarious. And I felt <laughs> like that, that, that was the culminating event of the cat relays. And that kind of brought everyone together, I noticed, because it was funny to watch these really big guys spin around a bat and then just, you know, wobble down 40 yards and they would fall. And, it, you know, it was, it was a fun way for everyone to get involved. Um, uh, for me, I mean, just games because I like everyone's competitive, so I, the games are always fun. Uh, but I like times where a barbecue or just something relaxing to get everyone together and just you know keep it. If you really want to keep it non-competitive and really out of the athletic standpoint, make sure no real trash talking gets going and everyone can really just relax. I think barbecues where it's a really mellow environment and people can come and feel like they can just be themselves and get to know somebody without having to discuss football or schemes or plays or training or anything like that. They can talk about, Hey, what, you know, where'd you go to high school or what was it like living in Miami or what's it like, you know, what do people do for fun out in the middle of Kansas or, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff that you can learn about somebody that it doesn't seem like those things would help. But when you know more about the person you're playing with, you're more inclined to play harder for them because you know them a little bit deeper than on the surface of, hey, he's a really good receiver, but that's all I know. So I noticed when I felt more connected to the guys and they felt more connected to me and we were more open with each other that, you know, we could play harder for each other. Yeah, you, you, if you're listening to this, you have to build that connection. You have to build rapport with each other because that builds trust, you know, when, you, when you're in competition. You know what it's like to play with somebody that you don't trust. You're, if you're a quarterback, I'm probably not going to throw you the ball if I don't trust you. You know, if I'm offensive coordinator, I'm probably not going to give you carries if I don't trust you. So in a way, it, it, work, it works on both ends for the, for the student athletes, but also the coaches at the same time. So there, there has to be be uh, a, a collection of energy on both ends that has to come together you know man um, we're getting into the fourth quarter into our two-minute drill actually explain the benefits of an athlete having a performance coach I think that it's I mean very beneficial because you know once again like like myself I have my dad there so not only is the I mean he was a very good coach all around of just being diligent, time management, but you know, so people that don't have uh, someone like that around all the time, you need someone there. Or, uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on. Don't look to be found by a performance coach. Go out and actively seek somebody that you feel like will hold you accountable, push you, help guide you the right way, give you the tools and knowledge you need to succeed at what it is that you want to do. And uh, the biggest things for me are really, really simple things that most people just don't practice over and over, like time management, hard work, perseverance, you know, how to bounce back from a loss, how to build up your own momentum, how to lead yourself, how to be a better leader, how to be a better student. Um, Just a lot of things that 
you may be blind on your own and thinking you know it all is one of the biggest, most devastating things you can ever do because you don't know it all. And the chances, especially when you think you know it all, the chances of you being blindsided by something that was very obvious that someone else might have seen are really high. So be open to criticism and don't look at it as a bad thing because with criticism comes growth and you know everybody always has to continue to adapt and evolve if you're staying the same well this is one of the favorite things my dad always told me that if you're staying the same you, someone's beating you because there's no such thing as staying the same you're either getting better or you're getting worse so make sure you're doing something to improve every day whether it's athletically mentally uh spiritually what i mean whatever do something to improve from where you are today from where you are tomorrow and don't get caught up comparing yourself to the top 10 ranking list that somebody put out or you know who they're saying is better over here who's got more twitter followers none of that has anything to do with you and doesn't help you get any better so focus on yourself and make sure you have someone to push you appropriately now i wanted to close out with uh two questions jaron what what is one piece of advice and you've given us a lot but what's one piece of advice that you'd want to leave the student athlete with today I mean, really what I just said is, is my biggest thing and it, and it opened my eyes more because I, I mean, I've been dealing with people that come in for injury treatment, high school players, but at now coaching that team and being around guys that are high level players and being recruited and just seeing the differences between certain people and thinking, you know, back to how I was that just because you're getting recruited or not getting recruited has no impact or effect on your work ethic and what you're doing today. So you may have gotten that one offer you were looking for. You may have already committed. You may have no offers. What you do daily should still be like you're working for that first offer. So for me, when I finally committed to Kansas State, it felt great. Like, cool, I got that scholarship. A lot of these kids I see go into a coast mode and then they show up as like, well, I'm, a, you know, I'm here. They told me I'm going to be all great. It's like, yeah, they told 25 other kids the same thing too. And they told the 25 kids the year before that and the year before that. So what are you going to do to show up now? The four stars or five stars or three or however many stars you had or how many offers you had before you came here, none of that matters because someone's lining up across from you ready to rip your throat out. So continue to improve and evolve and work on your craft because if you don't, when you show up, you're going to look and I mean, it's going to look horrible. You don't want to go embarrass yourself. You don't want to embarrass your name, where you came from, that school. I mean, maybe the, maybe you go there and you're so bad that – Nobody, they'll never come back to that school again because you were just so overhyped or you just got lazy. So never get lazy, never get, I mean, never get complacent. I guess all that, all this would stem down to complacency. People getting what they thought they wanted and not realizing the extra work and the continued work that goes into it. So that's one thing that just, it frustrated me a lot, as you can probably tell, seeing yeah. these guys get four and five stars and all these ratings that I was like, I know I'm better than them, but once again, that doesn't matter because we're going to show up at the same school and now those stars don't matter at all and I get a chance to beat you and sh prove to them I'm better than you. And that was one of the better feelings to me of finally, you know, after my college career, finally being first team all Big 12 tight end when I wasn't even first team all Metro in Oregon. Right. So, to, you know, that was, you know, an example of, you know, s screw your list. Um, I know I can ball. And I'm going to put this work in and go out and do it. And I'm, I'm quite sure some of those guys, they disappeared throughout your years of college and playing in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, there was one, there was one other guy on the top 15 list from Oregon my senior year that made it to the league. One. Yep. And there was only, there was three or four that even ended up playing in college, like starting and being a contributing player. So I mean, it's, don't focus on that at all. It does not matter. What, what matters what, is winning. Yeah. I'm um, sorry for interrupting you. you what go. personal development book would you recommend for our audience, Coach? Well, I'd love for everyone to pick up my book when it comes out. I um, I'm really, I really aim that with a lot of a lot of stuff we've talked about today. I go into a little more detail, a little more example with. So I, I really want to get that in the hands of these high school kids. Uh, as well as other, you know, business leaders or people that want to be a leader. Um, but I, I really like uh, Shoe Dog that Phil Knight just came out with. Yes. And I, and I really like Driven From Within by Michael Jordan. Uh, both of those, I felt, I mean, as a business owner, 
and, and, and I mean, obviously Nike's from here, Phil Knight's from Portland. I mean, it's a story I can resonate with, with someone from my area doing something really big, you know, in my own backyard and just how he talked about it and what he was up against and all the ups and downs he dealt with that most people just look at it like, oh my gosh, Nike's just so great or, you know, whatever they think of it. But what he did to start that thing, because it was nothing at one point and he built it all the way to what it is now. So uh, I just like seeing stories of, you know, the work people put in behind the scenes, because I think it directly correlates to the work people need to put in behind the scenes to be a good athlete. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first with Jaron Mastrude. 